Good evening, everyone, and welcome from a very wet and windy Scotland. So hopefully the weather's better where, where you are. We're getting a well and truly August winter kind of shift going on here. This is our second last uh, webinar of 2022, and I'm really, really pleased to welcome back Amy, who did one the same time last year, which was on autoimmunity. Um, so that's a bit of a specialist area, area for Amy. Amy's a nutritional therapist, also an athlete with a lot of sporting experience. So the two of us got on really well with our uh, topic that we like to share. Amy is very, very good on female specific aspects of health um, and what I call health-based performance. That's the majority of her client base. And she does work a lot with autoimmunity. And of course, underlying autoimmunity is inflammation and immune dysregulation. So that's going to be the feature of this talk tonight, not necessarily going into pathology as specifically as autoimmunity, but inflammation, if you don't manage it, you don't recover from um, exercise so well, um, illness recovery, injury recovery can be inhibited as well. So it's a really, really key fundamental topic. We'll use the, the standard um, sort of setup for this webinar. Um, we'll let Amy do her presentation, which uh, I've, I've suggested she goes for 40, 40 minutes plus or minus. During that time, We'll do a bit of interaction on the chat box. If you get any questions that come up, throw them in the chat box straight away. Um, I can answer some as we go. Um, if there's any that I think are really good at the time, I'll, I'll interrupt Amy and ask them. Otherwise, we'll do a Q&A section at the end. Um, so we'll go for an hour. If there's a lot of discussion or need to go longer, we can do so. Okay, Amy, over to you. Thank you very much, Ian. So, um, well, I'm glad to be here and uh, I love doing these uh, topics because more than anything, um, I find it really interesting doing all the research around it. So um, I've been a nutritional therapist now for 11 years. And in that time, I would say the majority of my um, clients have been um, female. So uh, this is a topic that's really important to me. Um, I have got an autoimmune condition, a very rare one called Abstin's disease. And so for me, managing inflammation and still being able to exercise um, has been key and really important. And so I really wanted to sort of uh, dig, dig a bit deeper, really. I've also, I'm also menopausal. So the um, development of the autoimmune condition has pushed me into um a premature menopause and so the changing of all my estrogens and progesterone has an impact as well so I really thought that you know this this is affecting many of my clients and it will be affecting a lot of ladies out there so that's why I've decided to pick this topic um but before we begin, I just really want to reiterate that there's no one answer to this. Um, the more I've looked into it the more I've established that actually um, you know Females do experience a lot of inflammation, but actually it's about getting the body in balance and what is going on in the body as to why we're getting the inflammation. So we'll delve a bit deeper. Okay, so what is inflammation and inflammation in disease? Well, inflammation has uh, long been a well-known symptom of many inf infectious diseases, but research increasingly suggests that it's alter also intimately a broad range of non-infectious diseases, perhaps even all of them. So according to Dr. Brent Bauer of the Mayo um, Clinic, research now believes that low-grade inflammation is associated, oops, sorry, I'm clicking here, with men, most chronic diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, arthritis, cancers. So these chronic conditions um, that are affecting many, many people now, and actually it's the low-grade inflammation that seems to be causing the majority of these problems. So inflammation is not just about have I got have I banged my my ankle in exercise and is it inflamed? It's actually creating a lot of these really chronic conditions. So it's really important to get a grip of. So I'm just going to actually move me and Ian up the top of my machine here because I can't see what I'm reading. Right. Okay. So 
What is inflammation? Well, it's an acute inflammatory response and it's part of the body's innate defense. And it's triggered by potential infectious or non-infectious th threats. So we've got bacteria, we've got viruses, so things like COVID. Um, one of the reasons that there's been a, um, a difference in how people have reacted to the virus is because of this inflammatory cascade that's been created. So viruses cause inflammation. Damage to the barrier, so whether that's skin, so whether or not you've cut yourself and you're getting inflammation that way because there's been um, a break in the barrier, or the gut, so leaky gut, huge um, in influence on inflammation if we have leaky gut injury or wounds, toxins. So, you know, what we're breathing in is a mold in the house. This can create inflammation, foreign objects, or of course, then we have things like allergens. So for instance, um, gluten for a celiac. So in pro-inflammatory mediators, stimulate increased blood flow and vascular permeability to enable plasma and nucleosides to the injured site. So this is when we're getting the swelling, we're getting the redness. Um, with the you know the body's creating an immune response it's it's sort of um getting the army um in place to fight the invader so to speak then we have the resolution phase of inflammation and this is a really really important phase because this promotes repair of the damaged tissues and it's the elimination of the harmful stresses and this is how the body is starting to get back into homeostasis so this is really you know we have the inflammatory response which we're supposed to have and it's important to help the body but then we really need to get back into homeostasis we don't want the inflammation to continue so we have these specialized pro-resolving mediators um, that are produced and they're not an anti-inflammatory activity they're more to promote the resolution to to improve the position because when inflammation occurs it creates lots of damage to that area so we need to um, resolve that and that's what these specialized pro-resolving mediators are for so what are some of the main differences in men and women? Well, us women, we're less susceptible to infectious diseases than men, but we are much more susceptible to autoimmune diseases. So there does seem to be um, a bit of a shift there. So when we look at autoimmune diseases, um, you know, some, some um, figures show up to 80% of autoimmune conditions are, are women that are receiving these diseases. So that's a really high amount. So what is going on? Well, it's partly attributable to the X chromosome, which has many genes relating to the immune system. So the X chromosome contains um, a thousand genes, while the Y chromosome only has about a hundred, and many of the X linked genes relate to the immune system. So women are producing much more immune, immunoglobulins than men. So this is why we're able to fight these infectious diseases. But the larger number of genes originating from the X chromosomes creates a far greater possibility for mutations to occur. Thus the autoimmunity, thus the inflammation. So, um, you know, it's really important to sort of get that, that idea. But what I don't want us to think about is that autoimmunity automatically means that women have just got long, um, you know, that's, that's it. We're just inflamed forevermore. It doesn't have to be that way. It's about getting the body in balance. So that's what we're going to look at. It's really about looking at the bigger picture. So look, this is, this is showing just some of the autoimmune diseases and the differences between men and women. So we are much more prone to it. Now I've, I've, I was diagnosed, I think three and a half years ago and, um, I was really ill, really ill to begin with, but I have done everything in my power to reduce the inflammation. That is the main thing I do every single day. I watch what I'm eating. I check I haven't got any infectious, any other um, viruses or bacteria. I've been looking at my digestion and I've spent the whole, the last three and a half years making sure my inflammation is low and I haven't had another autoimmune flare since. So it absolutely is possible. And in that time, my estrogens have dropped off my progesterone my progesterone has dropped off I'm not getting any periods anymore so you know there are there are things that should mean that I should be a bit more inflamed but actually I'm probably healthier now than I, I would say than I was a year before I was I was diagnosed so it's about looking at the bigger picture I'm always about balance and looking at the bigger picture so what's happening with pre-menopausal women well most estrogens produced in the ovaries Oops, sorry, I keep touching things and moving my slides all over the place. So 
most most I'm not going to touch my screen again. Most um, estrogens are produced by the ovary, ovaries. Um, they're released into circulation and large amounts exert their effects on many target organs throughout throughout the body. After menopause, when estrogen production um, from the ovaries falls, circulation of these estrogens um, decreases dramatically and then estrogen synthesizes mainly from our adipose tissue. So that's where we've got our fat stores. So if we look at the cycle, so women who are, um, are menstruating, the, we've got the early follicular um, stage. This is where we have the bleed um, and estrogens are low and progesterones are low. Then we move on to the follicular. We've got higher estrogens and low progesterone. The early luteal, um, uh, we've got low estrogen and high progesterone, and then the luteal and premenstrual, low estrogen and progesterone. Now, you can see just in that whole 28 day or month, there it's like this wonderful dance of um, hormones. These hormones know exactly what they should be doing. Uh, one minute they're high, one minute they're low. And it is really, really important for the body to have these in balance. Many of the ladies that I see, and I see people from all different ages, they might come with, um, you know, IBS, say. But actually, when you dig a bit deeper, you start to see that actually they, um, they, their menstrual cycle has not been in balance from the age they were 15. It was an imbalance when they began their periods. And it's just, they've just got used to it being that way. They've got used to the inflammation that they feel when they have um, sore breasts, when they have cramps, when they have pain, um, when they get anxiety and depression. They just think it's normal and it doesn't need to be normal. And when these estrogens and progesterone are already not in balance, there's already, you can see that the balance is out, inflammation is starting to build, and then that can lead on to then, let's say, autoimmune conditions or cardiovascular disease or other conditions. So we need to be looking at the basics to start with. So is estrogen friend or foe? So estrogen in larger quantities can decrease inflammation by increasing regulatory cytokines, such as interleukin, interleukin-10, and transforming growth factor. <clears throat> and it's believed to act as protective mechanism against such things as rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndrome. I always say that wrong. I probably said it wrong now, but Sjogren's syndrome. It has also been described to suppress vascular inflammation. So we have a lot of uh, research showing that estrogen is anti-inflammatory. Great stuff. On the other hand, there's lots of clinical studies that describe estrogen as pro-inflammatory. And in particular, in autoimmune diseases. So when we've got autoimmune diseases predominantly um, showing itself in ladies, now we've got estrogen can make this position even more inflammatory. So it can be quite confusing, but it's back again to balance and making sure we've got the estrogens high and low at the right times of the month. Okay, so... Then we look at things like histamine. Well, histamine is an inflammatory mediator and histamine symptoms are actually more common in women. And we can track the histamine responses in the men during the menstrual cycle. So they occur when estrogen is high, ovulation and just before the period. Now, histamine symptoms aren't just a snotty nose and runny eyes. Histamine, histamine symptoms can be acid indigestion. They can be bloating. They can be pain in your joints. They can be uh, migraines. They can be anxiety. So it can histamine can affect the body in many different ways. And we have different histamine receptor sites in the body. So if we've got estrogen that is not high at the right times and it's high all the month, you can see that actually this histamine as an inflammatory mediator is creating more histamine, more inflammation in the body. Oestrogen stimulates mast cells to release the histamine and also it downregulates the DAO enzyme that clears histamine. So we've got the histamine rising and it's blocking the enzyme that clears the histamine away. So just by actually managing your histamine response, managing, you know, maybe boosting your DAO enzyme, making your estrogens and progesterones in balance and not eating too many hist high histamine foods, foods, you can straight away start to balance that inflammation. At the same time, histamine stimulates the ovaries to make more estrogen. So if we're not getting it in balance, we end up with a little bit of a cascade. 
Progesterone, on the other hand, stabilizes mast cells, upregulates the DAO so you can clear out the histamine. And so we can really get the balance. So it's about, again, looking at, OK, well, what is going on with that estrogen and progesterone during the month? How can we get it in balance just to help, for instance, the histamine response? OK, so <clears throat> estrogen, we know um, from lots of research, is, has the ability to improve muscle mass and strength and also is great for collagen and um, connective tissue. So that's great for athletes and for those that are wanting to, um, to keep fit and do exercise, the estrogen can really help for that. However, unlike the supporting of bone and muscle where estrogen is positive, in tendons and ligaments, estrogen decreases stiffness and it directly affects performance and injury rates in ladies. So high estrogen levels can decrease power and, in, and performance, which is not good for us that want to do exercise, and it can make women more prone to ligament injury, thus more inflammation. So the ACL injuries of knees um, has a higher prevalence in women than it does in men, and it's this. it can be attributed to this estrogen again. So we need to get the balance. We need to make sure that there is not going to be this extra inflammation and um, problems with the injuries of the ligaments. Again, looking at the balance. Okay. So, estriol, which is the um, it's a, a weaker hormone um, out of the estrogens, and it's predominantly um, we have more of it when we're pregnant. So numerous studies, both experimental and clinical, imply that estriol and progesterol doses, such as those achieved through pregnancy, have a potent anti-inflammatory effect, and in particular on neuroprotective roles. So it's really good for the brain. So a large number of evidence now indicates that estrogens exert an anti-inflammatory activity, and it's thought that neuroprotective effects may be linked to the inhibition of micro, microglia activation. So that's the immune cells in the brain. So, we, we, you know, we've now got um, research showing that estriol and progesterone really anti-inflammatory. So, again, we've got this, this, this body of research which is pointing us to the fact that we need to have the right amount of estrogens and progesterones at the right time. It can be really good for the immune function of the brain. Progesterone can decrease inflammation by inhibiting the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and increasing anti-inflammatory cytokines. I like to think of progesterone as the hormone that um, is really, it's like a hug. It's really stabilizing for the estrogens. Okay, so when we think about um, the menopause now, so we we know that um, from some of the research, Estrogen and progesterone can be can be anti-inflammatory if it's in the right amounts at the right time. And it's also been shown to be protective of bones and joints. The Journal of Neuroinflammation suggests that estrogen is a potent anti-inflammatory factor. And therefore, when we get disturbances in the cyclical pattern of circulating estrogens, which happens when we are at the menopause transition, this can activate systemic innate and adaptive immune responses. Now, if we think about what happens, so um, perimenopause in particular can be two to 12 years. And in that time, you know, we don't just go from having estrogens, progesterones at a regular amount throughout the month to nothing. We can go through a period where we have really high levels of estrogen, really lower levels of estrogen. And at the same time, the progesterone is starting to decrease. So it can be really chaotic for the first couple of years for some ladies. So it can be really, so this cyclical pattern is really changing. So we've got high levels of estrogen and then we can have low levels of estrogen. And so often when they look at when ladies develop autoimmune conditions it, or girls, actually, it can happen just as puberty arises. So again, the estrogens are changing, the hormones are changing, can happen after pregnancy, after we've given birth. And then also this perimenopause, menopause time. So the, the, the changing in how the estrogens and progesterones are managed in the body can be a trigger for autoimmunity. It has also been shown that the decline in the circulating E2 estrogen after menopause is associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, cancer, diabetes, stroke, sleep disturbances, Alzheimer's, 
and cognitive decline, all inflammatory conditions. So the estrogens are dropping and then ladies are becoming, um, can, not they don't have to, they can become more prone to these inflammatory conditions. So it points again to the fact that the estrogens are, have had this protection throughout the um, the um, the years of having menstruation. It is important to note, however, that men do get those conditions as well. It isn't just ladies. So uh, men do get them too. And that actually um, there are higher rates of cardiovascular disease in men, diabetes and cancer. So it, it is more about the fact that there is a shift for ladies that these conditions, the inflammatory conditions, do tend to increase after menopause, which I think is really interesting. And when you've got that information, you absolutely can do something with it. You can support ladies um, so that these things don't happen. And what we've got to add on top of this is that, you know, many of the people that we are working with, many of the ladies that we're working with are wanting to do lots of exercise. And so, you know, we really need to make sure that we've got all our eggs in a row, that everything is is um, balanced so that we are not creating inflammation at the wrong times. OK, so we know through menopause, we've got a drop in these hormones. So something that can quite often happen in young girls and athletes that are um, exercising a lot, in particular young girls who um, are, are training perhaps harder than they should be or not in a balance, amenorrhea can happen. So this is where there's an absence of menstrual periods, pre-menopause. So this is happening when it shouldn't necessarily be happening. So athletic amenorrhea can be caused by a range of factors related to over-exercising. Over so we know, now know that when, after menopause, when these estrogens are lower, we are more prone to inflammatory conditions. So we definitely don't want this to be happening to young girls and athletes at a young time. So, so you know, things we need to consider, low levels of body fat. So the female body cannot menstruate below a certain percentage of body fat. Exercise-related hormones. So exercise makes the body release certain hormones, such as beta endorphins and catching cold. Cold mains. High levels of these hormones are thought to affect how estrogen and progesterone work. Emotional stress. So strong negative emotions can have can affect the hypothalamus. So, you know, our our um our girls getting um very stressed about doing competition, you know, are they overly stressed? I mean, it's just quite a stressful time, isn't it? Being a teenager, I can remember. Um, so it's about making sure that we got balance it, distort disordered eating, such as crash diet and skipping meals. These are all things that can really affect what's happening with the periods. So we've seen the impact menopause can have can have on females, doesn't have to. So really we need to be thinking about this because we don't want this inflammatory cascade happening early on we need to make sure the bones are, are strong that it's not going to affect fertility cardiovascular disease and pelvic pain i think this is a really important area to be considering so then we go to things like depression now women experience higher rates of depression than men and it's a consistent path throughout all cultures and when we look at um uh po symptoms of pms in ladies, often when east or even through the menopause, often when estrogens are low, ladies experience depression, and depression is um, linked with inflammation. So again, it's pointing to the fact that actually the estrogens, when it's low, is creating an inflammatory response. So estrogens are anti-inflammatory in this in this um, in this, and when we look at depression, so from puberty through the reproductive years, women have done it again women um, have a higher risk of major depressive disorder compared to men so a meta-analytic finding suggests that mdd patients have elevated inflammation levels compared to healthy controls so is this because of the estrogens importantly prospective studies indicate that elevated inflammation increases subsequent risk for depression so it is again like a cascade if you've got inflamed um inflammation levels are high it can then create more depression so you know we need to look at the bigger picture what's going on but there is does appear to be a link so where does that leave us and where does that leave me with my time i'm doing okay so where does that leave us so 
Estrogens, eggs hurt beneficial effects on a myriad of body systems, including cardiovascular, including the brain. It has also been shown that the decline in E2 estrogen after menopause is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, cancer, diabetes, stroke, sleep disturbances, and cognitive decline. Inflammation may be a key contributor to depression in women. However, so, you know, estrogens on the one hand are anti-inflammatory, can be. On the other hand, women have a higher rate of autoimmune diseases compared to men, including a twofold to ninefold greater risk for lupus, Hashimoto's, thyroid, thyroiditis and rheumatoid arthritis. Puberty and perimenopause women are at greater risk, an indication of these changing hormones. Additionally, more women have clinically relevant elevations of CRP, which is an inflammatory marker indicating cardiovascular risk compared to men. Furthermore, multiple factors that elevate major depressive disorder can also promote inflammation, suggesting overlapping pathways. So how, what, what, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as nutritional therapists or uh, of those of us who are trying to manage these symptoms? Now, well, the way I like to look at it is looking at the, pig, the bigger picture. So in clinic, when we look at somebody that has a, any type of condition, there is usually inflammation at the heart of it. So it's about looking at why is that happening, looking at the bigger picture. Yes, we need to make sure we've got everything in balance. The body wants to be in homeostasis. But in order to do that, we need to look at some key elements. So we need to look at the body as a whole. So we need to look at the hormone. So whether somebody is 12, 22, 42, 62, 82, or 92, we need to look at the balance of the sex hormones, the stress hormones, insulin as a hormone, when we're looking at inflammation. So, you know, the, we need to get to the bottom of it. What, what are the symptoms? Are the symptoms of high estrogen or low estrogen? Are we getting anxiety or depression? Are we getting um, pain, flooding? Um, how long is the um, is the bleed for? Is there hardly any bleed? You know, all of these things give us a lot of information. What are the stress hormones doing? Stress hormones absolutely impact on inflammation. So all of these things, insulin, our blood sugars being managed, all of these things have a huge impact when we're looking at the inflammation. So the and these you know these can be absolutely managed by looking at diet. Is there enough protein in the diet? Is there enough fat in the diet? Are, um, are there lots of processed foods in the diet, in which case that's going to be dis um, disrupting things? Are there lots of trans fats which will disrupt things? Is the gut bacteria being worked on? So, you know, hormones, they, they need estrobolome, estrobolome in the gut to help metabolize it. Is the liver working functionally? Now, all of these things, whilst we can look at all the research and we can say, yes, absolutely, autoimmunity is happening to ladies. But if you can get these basic bat hormones in balance and check that the, the, the gut is working well to metabolize the hormones, it can absolutely have a huge impact. Stress reduction. When the body is in fight or flight, it absolutely cannot deal with the immune system being regulated. It can't deal with reducing the inflammation. It can't deal with managing the hormones because it's in fight or flight. So it's really important to manage that stress. So with athletes in particular, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, especially the, uh, the ladies that I see, because I'm not dealing with, um, I'm not dealing with athletes that are, you know, it's not their job. They're trying to fit it in around work and they're trying to fit it in around families and trying to fit it in around everything. So they're getting up early, going to the gym, you know, doing a full days and work, sorting out the kids, coming back, then they're going for a run. So their day is super, super stressed. Um, and so these ladies absolutely need to be looking at the stress levels. So it's fitting in um, yoga, meditation, vagus nerve stimulation so that's things like you know just even gargling it doesn't have to be going for a sea swim in the cold water which is absolutely wonderful for it but it can be gargling after you've cleaned your teeth stimulating the vagus nerve which runs around here it can be um, singing when you're in the shower singing can stimulate the vagus nerve it's about finding ways throughout the day to help that stress reduction sitting in the garden listening to the birds having a cup of herbal tea for 
15 minutes first thing in the morning to just start your day off you know it's about finding time and I, I find that this is the thing that I talk about more than ever with all of my clients is reducing that stress and finding a way that it's going to work for the for that particular lady and then we have the gut this is absolutely key the gut has a direct it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like having a direct conversation with the immune system. If the bacteria in the gut is out of balance, um, for instance, some of the bacteria that can really stimulate inflammation, the Firmicutes and the Ruminococcus SP families, they're really implicated in inflammation. So if the gut bacteria is is got large amounts of these bacteria, then straight away, the gut is straight away sending a message to the immune system. We need the army. We need to create inflammation. And that's going to be happening all the time because if that bacteria is sat there within the gut, it's a constant. So really important to get that bacteria sorted. We want lots of anti-inflammatory bacteria. So bifidobacteria, bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, and enterococcus sp. You know, and we can get these really by making sure we've got a really balanced diet, lots and lots and lots of veggies, you know, lots of things like lentils and pulses. And, you know, it's getting lots of good fats. We need to get them all lots of fermented foods. We need to get them in the gut to thrive that bacteria so that we've got a good conversation with the immune system. So it's key that, you know, the gut barrier is really key. So it, I talked about it earlier on about the uh, the barrier being broken. We, there can't be any leaky gut. We need that to be really, really strong, that membrane. So working on the gut is key. And actually, you know, that was what I would say was key for me, working on the gut. Well, actually, I'm the stress <laughs> because I was very stressed when I got my autoimmune condition. So working on the stress and working on the gut were the two things that absolutely did it for me. Then we've got things like toxins and infections. So if somebody is um, suffering with cold sores every month, the body is having to deal with that con continuously. You need to get on top of that. Glandular fever, COVID now is another one. You know, people who are suffering with long COVID, it's creating an immune response continually, which is then going to create more inflammation. And toxins, people don't realize the toxins that they are surrounding themselves with on a daily basis. So we've got, you know, mold is checking that there's no mold behind the curtains on, you know, in the, the back of the wardrobe, um, in the shower. Mold releases um, my, mycotoxins, which you breathe in and the immune system is going to fire up, create this inflammation. So this doesn't matter if you're a lady or a man. These things are affecting everybody. So if we're already in a position where we might be more vulnerable to things like autoimmune conditions, say, this is going to be so important because we need to make sure that when the generalized inflammation is reduced. Allergies and intolerances. So I would say that um, majority of people that I speak to, and they've all got gut issues. Once you go through it, they've all got gut, gut issues of some kind. I can say when I've gone through what they're eating, they will generally tell me a certain food that makes them bloat or a certain food that makes them burp or a certain food that gives them wind generally if those foods are doing that then there's a high chance that you're intolerant to it even without doing any further testing and that might be because the gut bacteria is out so straight away it's creating this inflammation so it's finding out which foods are causing a reaction in the body so whether that's an allergic reaction or an intolerance if it's an intolerance hopefully once the gut is healed they can be reintroduced again Gluten, I would say um, there's so much research out there and it's something that I find is absolutely so important for autoimmune conditions. Gluten just does not go hand in hand with autoimmune. So I would say everybody who's got an autoimmune condition, my advice would be to um, avoid it. Um, dairy can be a problem for some people. The deadly nightshades can be a, a, a huge problem for some with inflammation in their joints. Lectins, um, which are the protection on a lot of things like legumes and plant um, plant shoot foods. And then histamine. So we talked about histamine earlier on. If histamine is a problem for a period of time whilst you're healing the gut and you're getting the the hormones in balance and you're getting the DAO sorted, which is the enzyme, then it's worth reducing the histamine foods. So the histamine is like a bucket and um, when it overflows, so it's a bit like you've got a bucket of water. If you can't clear out the histamine, 
then that inflammation is just going to go to the joints, it's going to go to the skin, it's going to go to the brain, it's going to go to wherever um, on the body. So you can absolutely control that. That's something that can be done very easily, very, very easily, and it can create a huge relief very, very quickly. Then we've got things like doing some testing. Now, there is a Dutch test that can really look at, um, it's a, an advanced hormone test, look at what the metabolites are for estrogens and progesterone and steroid hormones and, and you name it. It's a, it's a, it's a very comprehensive test. Um, I don't tend to use that. I tend to more go towards the nutrigenomics testing. Um, Life Code um, do some re really lovely um, nutrigenomics testing where you can look specifically at hormones, the sex hormones, the stress hormones, um, detoxification, which is key, and methylation. Or you can look at estrogen balance um, specifically with the nutrigenomics testing. They do a lot of lots of testing. And with that, what you're doing is you're looking at the genome. Um, so you, you've got for that person, you can see exactly where the areas are that could be an issue, where there might be SNPs on the gene, which could mean that it's difficult, for instance, to metabolize estrogen or to methylate. So really, really important. And um, I find hugely helpful. Stool testing is, again, um, that's going to allow you to look at what is in the gut is there bacteria there that shouldn't be there? Is there enough of the beneficial bacteria? Is there inflammation in the membrane? You know, what is going on? Um, so these these can really give the information needed to improve. And vitamin D, so, so, so important for inflammation. And if you, you know, that comes back to the genetics as well. If you're not able to um, metabolize vitamin D, inflammation is going to be an issue or could be an issue. So Medichex do a check, do a vitamin. Actually, you can, there's lots of places to do the vitamin D test and it's really, um, and especially for autoimmunity, really, really important. And then just very, very basic things that everybody can include in the diet daily. Methylate, DNA methylation is so important to regulate inflammation and the inflammatory genes. So these are foods that we want to be included anyway, dark leafy greens. Um, we've got cruciferous, cruciferous veg, liver, uh, lovely time for liver now, liver and onions, uh, beetroot, beans and legumes, shiitake mushrooms, seeds, turmeric, rosemary, berries, green tea. If you can get some of these in every day, you're really supporting the DNA methylation, which will help clear the inflammation and to balance it. We've also got the anti-inflammatory foods so that we all know, oily fish, nuts and seeds, brightly colored fruit and veg, olive oil. Um, you know, these these omega-3s, the, the puffers, the EPA and DHA are so important for the uh, specialized pro-resolving mediators that I talked about earlier on. We want to reduce the inflammation with the anti-inflammatory foods and then we need more of these rich omega-3s to then um, clear out to resolve the inflammation. Depending on the uh, the lady, they might need hormone supporting foods. So that might mean that they need some more, you know, flax seeds or, you know, phytoestrogens, flax seeds, tofu and the like. And then for the athletes, it's really important then that they manage the training and recovery of exercise, that they're not overtraining to create a, a situation with this amenorrhea, that it's time to recover so the stress isn't so high, that if the estrogens are a bit higher at certain times of the month and there's no balance, you're supporting the ligaments so that there's not going to be an injury. Um, it's just about making sure that there's not overtraining so the immune system is um, going to be vulnerable, which will then create the inflammation. So, you know, I went into it uh, hoping there was going to be a more of a um, definitive because that would have um, been wonderful. But as in anything to do with the body, it nothing is really definitive. Um, and I think it's about making sure that we have that balance, that the body is getting what it needs from all actions and that there's no... Um, that the body's not having an onslaught, whether it's from toxins, whether it's from stress, whether it's from foods, whether it's from bacteria, it's about getting the balance, whether it's from hormones. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I, I think I've managed to do it in 40 minutes. Have I just 41 minutes? <laughs> Very good, Amy. I'm just in the middle of typing away to uh, respond to Jenny there. So we've got, we've got some questions. That I think it'd be really nice. Um, 
Are you done with your slides? Do you want to? I am. Yeah. Do you want me to? You know, unshare and we can see your face. Uh -huh. okay. Oh, did you not see my my face through all that? So when I was flapping around, you couldn't see any of that. <laughs> we, we see that the post <laughs> postage stamp size. So uh, I do find it really difficult to speak without moving my arms. That's why I kept ending up moving the, the slides. <laughs> cool. Right. So I'm going to go to Sue's question, which I thought was uh, quite a nice one. I've done some response, but I think you, you would uh, do this more justice. So does higher than normal levels of hormones, uh, comma, estrogen, cortisol, emotional stress, training hard, in brackets, comrades training. So uh, she's a South African and comrades is the ultra marathon, which is around about 90 kilometers in distance. Ooh. Okay. So it's a biggie. Yeah. It's very famous in ultra uh, ultra distance running. Um, so do these all increase the occurrence of injury? I've been battling with proximal uh, hamstring tendinopathy for months now. Okay, so she's trying to link all these emotional stress, hard training, and potentially hormonal imbalance or flux with injury. So uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I would say that's not helping. I know for me, I started getting um, uh, Achilles tendonitis and it is because of uh, this very thing, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know how old um, this lady is. Sorry, I've forgotten her name already. Is is that, are we talking sort so, of? So uh, if you're okay with it, put a, a ballpark age in the, in the box for us. I will give uh, Amy a, a starting. Okay. No, we haven't. Not yet. Is Sue still on? Yeah. Um, age 38. There okay. You go. So, so uh, a little bit young yet to start with um, perimenopause, but absolutely, you know, the, the, the change in the estrogens and actually the stress, um, response as well is going to be it's definitely going to leave her more open to her injuries and especially the length the amount of training I'm assuming that she's doing is she is we, it's really important to make sure you're getting that downtime so that the immune system can deal with the inflammation and you've got time to calm the immune system down if you're in that um, state of fight or flight from overtrain it well not you may not be overtraining but from training really hard if you're not got the downtime then the body hasn't got time to recover and so healing repair is going to be a bit more tricky so you really need to find that balance um which i know is difficult when you're doing such a um, an intense um training regime and checking what your hormones are doing so if they are um in a big flux then i would balancing those estrogens are definitely going to have an impact because obviously as as with the research was showing if the estrogens are um really high then the the tendons and the ligaments are not going to be as stable so it's about looking to see what is happening and what is the picture with your estrogen balance um yeah and so the symptoms of high estrogen might be anxiety there might be swollen sore breasts it might be that um you know you're getting heavier than abnormal bleeding or extra pain so it's about just sort of having a look at what is happening with with the cycle um, and then trying to look at how you can manage it so things like seed cycling can work really well because it can really get the hormones in the right place so perhaps have a little look at if you put seed cycling on the internet oh, I don't know if we can share it at some point but seed cycling can really help get the so the levels of estrogen and progesterone right throughout the month um, and that's quite a simple thing because the seeds are really good to you know ground seeds to add into your smoothies and stuff for recovery so that that could work making sure you're getting enough phytoestrogen so that actually if you're in a period where your estrogen is too low, you're getting some estrogen. So flax seeds would be good for that and tofu. And if you're in a period where the estrogens are too high, then the phytoestrogen foods will um, mimic your own estrogen, but it's a, a lesser extent. So you don't get such um, a surge, um, but you need really good gut bacteria for that as well. I hope that helps a bit. Thanks. Um, I knew you could expand my uh, little explanation. Um, I'll just throw into the picture as well. In South Africa, the um, runners go very early morning and it's high okay. volume. It's much more volume rather than quality. So there is that aspect. So Sue, watch your sleep. 
look at your overall stress load and look at your recovery in between sessions. So it's about, yes, get those good sessions out, including certain strategized long runs, but then you need the downtime and you need to properly do the downtime. Yeah. And actually cold, um, if you, I don't know if you, if um, so uses cold water or not, but actually that will reduce the inflammation immediately after the exercise. So getting in a cold bath <laughs> calms the nervous system and it's good for reducing the inflammation if you're brave enough. If we've got time, I, I'd love to chat more to you about the cold water immersion after exercise. Um, but there's a few more questions first. Do, 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 do. Uh, right, I'm going to go into Jenny's. Um, okay, so balance of inflammation. Is it that ongoing or unresolved inflammation will impact recovery adversely, but some degrees of inflammation is expected with the right level of training, which will increase blood flow and bring nutrients to the tissue to assist with recovery. So I think that's well said. It's about balancing and resolving any low level. Chronic resolving is, is the important bit. Yeah, I think that's what gets yeah. missed sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the key point there that Jenny's making, it's about, we're talking about chronic inflammation and as opposed to the acute responses to singular exercise sessions. Yeah. Of course, though, if you're chaining too much hard exercise together uh, without the adequate recovery, then the acute inflammation ends up chaining together into a chronic inflammation as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Here's Jenny again. What's the biggest way to check balance? Uh, I train five to six times per week, about eight hours. I have managed psoriasis, two bad outbreaks, one five years ago and one this January after COVID. Oh. I've managed my recovery naturally, but would you re recommend testing C-reactive protein, keeping an eye on HRV, heart rate variability? What indicators would help me check? I'm fairly well balanced, so less likely to have another flare. Or is it relying on how you feel? Okay, what do you think of that question? Um, I think that's great that you're managing it with all that exercise. You're obviously doing a really good job and making sure you're looking after yourself. COVID is, um, there's been notorious for out, for autoimmune um, flare-ups following COVID because of this inflammatory cascade. So I would really watch your histamine. Um, I don't know if you're getting any long COVID symptoms at all, but last January is, is a long time ago now. So I'm assuming things have improved in that time. Um, what I would look at is what's going on in the gut in particular. So you could do a stool test. I don't know um, if you're able to get a, a stool test or somebody to sort of um, look at it for you to discuss it. But from that, you can have a look to see exactly what's going on in your gut. So especially after COVID and from lots of Intense exercise, it can change the gut microbiome. So it's about making sure that that's nice and strong. There's a big link between the gut bacteria, certain gut bacteria. I can't remember which ones at the moment. Um, and psoriasis is a very, very big link. So I would that's one of the things I would look out for you, especially as you seem to be managing it really well. And that can really optimize it. I'm um, definitely CRP as well, because that's going to check what your inflammatory markers are. Um, and, you know, just checking that there's no... Um, you could, you could, I don't know if you can do um, nutrigenomics testing. Is this South Africa again we're looking at? No, no. Jenny's, a, Jenny's a nutritional therapist in the UK. Oh, okay. I'd look at, oh, there we are. So I would definitely be looking at something like nutrigenomics testing to have a look at what your genetic profile, I found it really, really useful for myself. Um, you can really get a gauge for your need for certain nutrients and whether you're methylating really well. And so, for instance, methylation as well. I, I, um, I've had a little boy who was getting extreme histamine responses, huge inflammation throughout the body. But actually, when we looked at methylation, um, sorry, when we looked at histamine in his genetics, it was nothing to do with histamine. It was methylation that was causing his problems. So the genetics test, if because you would be able to get them, I would have a look at that. I'm just going to add in for Jenny as well. So Jenny, I know, does CrossFit. Um, in traditional periodization of training, we will maybe do a hard hitting session three times a week, and then the rest are kind of recuperation stroke 
conditioning type exercises. So just if you're training six times a week, make sure half of it is more facilitating that stability and conditioning and the recuperation onto the next big hitting session. Uh, that's really, really important. Uh, right. Marianne is asking any advice for postmenopausal increased body pain after exercise and injury. Okay, so um, I would be looking at the gut again to make sure that because we really need the estrobolum to be working really well. So that's in the gut bacteria. And that's, um, it's really important for metabolizing estrogens anyway. But when we're postmenopausal, and we're really relying on things like our fat stores and the foods we're eating in order to create extra estrogens, then I would be looking at that to see that that's nice and strong, and that you're getting plenty of phytoestrogens so that you're getting more of these um, phytoestrogens. So you're getting a higher degree of estrogen to help with the anti inflammatory effects. Um, sorry, what was the rest of the question? My brain went off on one then. So we're looking at <laughs> postmenopausal so advice for postmenopausal increased body pain after exercise. Pain. And yeah. Injury. Yeah. So this this um, lowering of estrogen typically can be associated with body pain. So I would be looking at definitely trying to to get the estrobolum up so that you're making more estrogens yourself um, and making sure you're getting phytoestrogens in your diet every day making sure you're getting all those um, lovely omega-3s for the, the resolution so that you're getting. And actually, um, am I allowed to say supplement company? Yeah, on you go then. Can I? So Nutri have got a really good new project product called Opti Resolve, um, which is really focusing on the, um, uh, the pro resolve. Um, so reducing the resolution of the inflammation. Um, it's a very, very good supplement. So I would have a look at that. Cool. Um, okay. All right. So Rania, if I've said your name right, has just shared a, a link on seed cycling. So thank you. Um, okay. Sue is asking, uh, you mentioned knowing hormone levels and what may be going on. How do you advise going about knowing what hormones are doing? So going for a blood test. Yeah. So the, the uh, doctors, test. the doctors might do it. Um, hopefully they will depending on your age. Um, but I have lots of ladies that come with very, very clear menopausal symptoms or and they still won't get blood tests. So it, you might have to go privately, but a blood test will show you where you are, um, you know, luteinizing home one, you want to know just what your levels are to see where you are in the um, the stage of you know, perimenopause, menopause, or actually, if you're younger, you still need to know what the levels are. The Dutch test would give you that. The Dutch test will give you a lot of information. It's not very cheap, but it is very, very comprehensive. And the Dutch test is available in South Africa via Nordic laboratories. Um, okay, All right, that's that's all the main questions we've got in the chat. Any more, just fire them through. I'm going to pose a question right now, and that's about, you mentioned the cold water immersion, and I know you like the swimming in the, I do. In the sea. Um, so you've talked about the vagal toning aspect of that. Now, lying in a cold bath after exercise, the cold water immersion, that, that's been a good recuperation strategy for many years. But it's been, you know, well studied in science and scientists are now saying, well, actually, it could be impeding adaptive responses to exercise, including something like mTOR stimulation. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it's one of those other ones. Yes, use it, but don't do too much of it. What, what, yeah. what would your thoughts be? Yeah, I agree. And I think I'm coming at it from um, an autoimmune um, perspective so um, uh, I think uh, a training uh, if you're if you're fit and well and you've got a training um, the training adaptives is a different thing to when you're in an autoimmune flare then you want to be getting the inflammation down so I think it's about getting that balance like you said um, I know when I've had um, hands that just feel like they're really really like can't move them cold water is what does it for me you know I can do it for 10 minutes or going in the sea everything just calms down 
but if you're trying to get um, the uh, uh, you know from exercise you want to get a certain response then yeah I think it's about getting the balance right definitely plus you don't really want to be in cold water every day do you I think it depends on in your the winter. Body and your personality. <laughs> I remember doing warm weather stroke altitude training in Australia years ago, and um, they got us basically sitting in a what they called an aqueduct. It was just a yeah. channel of water. And even though it was there summer, it was freezing cold because it was at altitude. So you're yeah. shivering for 15 minutes and then get out. But I found it really, really helpful. And I think. We need to be careful with science saying yes or no. Yeah, absolutely. We need to take it to the person, person. if you find it helpful and yeah. you might be prone towards autoimmunity that might get yeah. increased with hard exercise, then yeah. it's a good strategy. Absolutely. And I I find it really quite addictive. You know, you when you go in the cold sea, I mean, I'm lucky enough I've got the Pembrokeshire coast. So going in the sea, it just straight away, you know, calms the whole body. The nervous system calms, but also you can just feel the body, yeah, calming the inflammation reducing. So um, it's been a good process for me. Okay. Any last questions, folks, before we finish? You're allowed to ask anything you want. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right. Nothing coming through at the moment. So, Amy, any last words of wisdom before we sign off for the evening? I think, um, yeah, it's about everybody's individual and how you respond to something might be different to somebody else. So it's definitely individual. And what's your stress? Because to me, stress is the biggest thing for everything. Yeah. Well said. Uh, I think the stress word, uh, I worked with a chiropractor in Johannesburg who said it nicely when he'd started practicing 15 years previously, nobody really talked about stress. People played golf and had mm. a much better work-life balance, but uh, now everyone seems to just be rushing around. So you get top athletes who are in a lovely position to be able to train full time and not work. And that's mm. great. Um, and they have the choice to then have this, I call it yin yang, mm. do the hard training training and then, and then pull back and recuperate. But the majority of recreational athletes are oh. now adding this yeah. to their whole. Um, so difficult. Work. And they're not just mm -hmm. doing a half marathon. It's Ironman and, you yeah. know, in amongst bringing up, toddlers and it's just phenomenal they've bought some people fit into a day so yeah it's it's yeah so it's I liked it who was it that who um from the course uh oh, can't remember now his name he called it life load yeah I mean I, I talk about life load but yeah there was somebody I think I stole that phrase off so. oh there we are <laughs> I use that all the time now I've stolen it off you I think it works really well life load definitely yeah excellent <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've got one more for the year, so the start of December, um, and that's Heidi, actually from South Africa, and she's going to talk about sulfation, which is her um, big ah. passion. And wow, that'd be good. As we know, goes everywhere. So mm. uh, yeah, that'll be a really good talk. Lovely. So, thank you, Amy. Thank uh, you. Thank you for asking, awesome. and thank you for joining. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.